are being yanked. Aloha, welcome back to East Meets West, day two. This is our concluding fireside chat. I am thrilled today to have with me Scott Mercer, the co-founder and CEO of Volta Industries. Hello, Scott. Hey, guys. And Greg Gouge, the uh, vice president at Ulupono Initiative. Hello, Greg. We were Hello. joking that Greg is just probably right across the street from me somewhere, but <laughs> yet we're here online. Scott, however, is in San Francisco, uh, I think. Is that where you are right now, Scott? That's me in our yeah. shop. Oh, that shop. The shop is very cool. If you guys ever go to San Francisco, you got to go check out Volta's shop. It's very fun to see. All right. So, Scott, I'm going to start with you. Um, we've known each other for, I think, about 10 years now. <laughs> this has been a long journey. So uh, it's really exciting for us at Blue. You're a portfolio company. You're a portfolio company of Hawaii Angels. You have roots here in Hawaii. You know, I remember the days you guys were working out of a garage in, in Kahala. Um, now you're a big deal, going public, all that. Um, in fact, we used to joke about you being a big deal, so it's funny that you are one now. Uh, <laughs> but I want to hear the story from your perspective. Tell us the kind of the Volta story in a nutshell here. How'd you get from there to here? I mean, I think that this is the good place to tell all of the embarrassing sort of early days stories. Yes. Uh, which might be interesting. Might be interesting to get your perspective since I think you might be the, uh, the <laughs> first professional person from the investment community that actually uh, would take our call. Only the <laughs> second or third time around. Um, I think just sort of winding all the way back, like I, we started Volta back in 2010 and really started with a lot of ambition and sort of enough naivete to not realize how hard it was gonna to be to actually build the thing we wanted to build. We yeah. started with an idea that was still the same path that we're along today, building EV charging infrastructure to sort of uh, fundamentally create the fueling infrastructure for the 21st century. And how does that work? How do you make money in day zero? How do you build something that can survive what is a fairly long but completely sort of faded to happen transaction or transition. Mm -hmm. And we started by sitting down in a cafe um, right next to UH and writing the business plan for three months, <laughs> coffee and sandwiches. And yeah. we wrote a 75 page business plan. We built the financial model. We sort of tried to figure out how we were gonna get it funded. We weren't naive enough to do it without any cash. Uh, so I came with money from my previous business, which was sort of a classic sports car business, really made 25 bucks an hour at a time, uh, fixing other people's fancy sports cars. Yeah, and this is where I have to cut in and embarrass you now, Scott, since you oh. gave me permission to embarrass. So this business plan, which I, I had a copy of, I wish I still did, it would be pretty funny. Um, you didn't put your headshots in it because I, I think you guys thought, oh, we're too young, they're not gonna take us seriously. And it, it had instead, uh, I believe it was uh, Iron Man, uh, Don Draper, and <laughs> somebody else or something. I think and Tesla I were the right. three. Yeah. Oh yeah, and Tesla, which I thought was so clever. I actually was like, I gotta meet these guys. <laughs> okay, now continue your story. All right, so now the other part of the embarrassing story. Uh, we took that business plan, uh, we sent it to Shinoa, to the office. Yes. Um, said, this is our plan, we're very excited to get started. For a half a million dollars, our angel investor gets 50% of the company. We look forward <laughs> to hearing from you. Never really did hear from you about that that uh, half a million dollars for 50% of the company thing. That's, that's right. That's, that's right. Really play. <laughs> <laughs> but nonetheless, where, where would I we be? this idea of supporting electric car charging with advertising, which was the essential idea from the beginning yeah. and still remains, was brilliant. I was like, this is really smart. Uh, this makes so much sense. I got. I got to help these you know guys make it make it to the next step at least in this process yeah <laughs> yeah the business plan not a lot of the financial assumptions of the business plan still remain the strategy of the business plan still remains and you were i think like i said the first proper professional person that we found that would actually help us figure out how to take that thing to real 
<laughs> That's funny. So now, Greg, you guys got involved like right after basically Blue Startups and Hawaii Angels. You guys were the first, um, you know, in in professional money in there. So and uh, institutional money. So tell us a bit about what you saw in Volta back in those early days. It was still pretty early when you guys got it. It, it was. It was still very early. Um, there, I'll be honest. I mean, there was folks internally that that had some concerns about <laughs> Scott's experience at the time. Um, but right, I mean, you look at you talk about the business plan and the value proposition that they were and the strategy that they were looking to execute. Um, you know, at at the time, it was groundbreaking. You had, you know, a number of players in the space coming off of kind of like the, some of the Obama era federal funding, and their strategy was I like build hardware, you know, and sell it. Um, and hope that people use it and, and we'll get revenue. But, you know, back in, you know, 2012 and whatnot, there weren't a lot of electric vehicles on the road, right? The Nissan Leaf was kind of just getting up to speed. There were some Teslas out there and whatnot. So there wasn't a lot of utilization. Um, and so a lot of those other business models were struggling. Um, and then in comes this, you know, very innovative business model. Let's say, say basically, we don't care how much utilization there is. We're going to give it away. And we're going to make money on the advertising, um, which was, you know, I, I think brilliant. I you know, obviously, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. Uh, mm -hmm. But then, you know, also, um, you know, you get into the details, and the the payback period, you know, was very strong, um, mm -hmm. and so it started to make a lot of sense. Um, and then you, you know, kind of go into the next layers from there. Okay, the team, like you know, Scott and the team at the time were were uh, you know young and ambitious, which is great. Um, and, but at the same time, they needed to round it out. And, and I think, you know, he very intelligently did that and, you know, surround himself with a lot of smart and capable people, um, to support the evolution of the company. Um, and so, you know, some of those fundamentals and obviously for us, I mean, being Hawaii focused, you know, it's, it was started here. Um, you guys were based here at the time and you were doing a lot, um, of, of making a lot of progress here in the state, which is important for us. Um, you know, it was kind of that, uh, you know, sad but excited to to see you guys go off on the mainland and kind of spread your wings and grow and you know realizing that's where the market is. Um, but at the same time, kind of you know, like, hey, don't forget about us. Like, remember to write home, um, <laughs> and you know, don't forget us, little people back here in the middle of the Pacific. Yeah. Well, I do think actually that Bolt has done a great job of not forgetting the little people. In fact. Yeah. Just in this last uh, announcement, the big announcement letter that went out to all investors, they said we wouldn't be here without yeah. our Hawaii peeps, you know. So yeah. uh, we appreciate the continued, uh, you know, uh, recognition of the, the role we all played in that. You know, going back to what Greg was saying about those early days, too, you know, and surrounding yourself with good people. I mean, one of the things that we used to joke about too, Scott, is that you stole all my angels at the time. <laughs> I think they all went to work for you. And um, I was like, wow, okay, I guess that's cool. But, uh, you know, so Chris Wendell, who was a Hawaii angel member, yeah, went. I still have one, yeah. Is now your co founder, essentially. I mean, he's been there really, yeah. really from a very, very early point as well. Um, but you were kind of gathering them all for for a bit. I was like, wow, okay, am I going to have any angels left? They're all going to be working for Volta now. Um, so that was, you know, an interesting strategy that I, I tell people about all the time. So I say, hey, turn your investors into, yeah. you know, some some of your executives. They're, they're motivated. They're probably more experienced than you. Uh, if you can convince them, as Scott did, it's a pretty good strategy. So, and Scott, like you said, that's worked out, right? Chris is still there. Chris is still here. And I mean, frankly, Chris has been formative to the business. So, and the fact that we are, we're still uh, on good terms and haven't gone at each other's throats after uh, almost now coming up on eight or nine years is, is pretty cool. So, yeah. yeah. So you guys are going public, Scott, via a SPAC. So we are. what the hell is a SPAC? For those of us in the audience who have never even heard this before, can you explain? I, I can explain sort of in general terms. Uh, probably it, it would be better to explain the SPAC, the SPAC process than me, but you guys get me. Um, so SPAC, a special purpose acquisition company, is set up by uh, a set of sort of experienced investors and operators, hopefully experienced investors and operators, that have access to, uh, pr to uh, public capital or capital that wants to be public um, and has the credentialization in the market 
to say, we're going to set up a company that has cash that looks for an acquisition target of an operating business that would be significantly accelerated with access to a larger pool of capital than the private market might provide. Mm. So for, for us and for vehicles in the electrification space, it's quite a good financing vehicle because these are very, very big, very long-term projects. This is not a SaaS business. This is something that requires mm -hmm. a massive amount of capital, but has a very long-term economic opportunity. Yeah. So why do that versus an IPO? What's the, what's the advantage there? So uh, within sort of the SPAC versus IPO process, I think um, SPACs provide speed. They provide mm -hmm a clarity of capital, clarity of capital access, mm -hmm. and a streamlined process to go to go down. It's not really appropriate for everything. Mm -hmm. um, it's certainly interesting for the, the EV and electrification space in general, because this is a huge fundamental shift. This will happen. It will happen and it will change massive, massive industries, but it requires significant capital. It is creating OEMs, new OEMs from scratch. It is creating sort of the fueling mm -hmm. infrastructure that underpins transportation from scratch. Mm -hmm. So the SPAC process gives businesses enough capital to be able to focus and run on building the core that needs to get built to build a business that can survive long term. Is that in general why SPACs are so popular right now with clean tech companies? Because we've seen a whole rash of these come out. In fact, I think Elemental Accelerator just announced another one of their companies being uh, going, you know, public via SPAC. So, you know, the clean tech SPAC space is especially hot right now. I'll, I'll be kind of frank, like our business, we're out to kill Shell. Like we are out to, re and really very, like, we think it's funny. We think it's, and we, I love the, the joke within the team, but we are out to sort of to kill oil. Mm -hmm. this, it's a long-term project. These things are hard. And these big capital intensive projects are not suited for venture capital. Mm. So these are things that require a very, very different frame. Yeah. Also, if you think about kind of the public investor market, I want the investors that are thinking about what is the long-term proposition for a Shell or a Chevron as OEMs and cities starts to announce full electrification targets mm. and say, you know what? We want to make a little sort of hedge bet in electrification because these are huge industries, but they are huge industries with a, certainly an interesting future, but not a clear future. Mm. So the path for things that are moving sort of up and forward to be able to be that hedge is, is pretty cool. Interesting. Um, Greg, back to you, you know, the Hawaii connection here is, um, you know, the original connection, but as we talked about, you know, the headquarters is now in San Francisco. Um, how do you think this, event, if we will, with uh, with Volta uh, going public, how does it impact Hawaii? How do you see it playing out here in the ecosystem? Does it have an impact for us? You know, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, in short, absolutely. Um, you know, I, when I read the news, I was excited, not just for, for Scott and the team and for us and for you guys and all that have, you know, supported that and been part of that, but for Hawaii as well, the ecosystem here. Um, you know, off the bat, I think, you know, there's two very positive um, momentum and, and progress that I think this will propel. One, you know, obviously it helps to have, you know, kind of a big win um, out there and, and kind of an example that says, hey, you know, it, it can be done, right? You know, you go, you go back to your, some of your, your initial comments, right? You know, Scott and, and those guys started this in the garage in Kahala and, and now they're going public, right? It, it can be done. It doesn't have to be done in, in San Jose or, or uh, you know, San Francisco. It can be done here. Um, so that's, you know, I think very encouraging for everyone in the audience, everyone trying to do it. And for, you know, us as, as um, participants in the ecosystem that, uh, you know, that's why we're here and that's what we're shooting for. And then it, the next, in my view, kind of big thing is, right, this ideally, right, uh, enables a lot more um, investment activity in the market, right? It, when and, and, and when this happens and, and closes it, you know, I think it will be a, a, a success for a lot of people here in Hawaii that then they can turn right and, and reinvest back into the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, so it should open up a lot more opportunity 
um, for for that as well. Um, again, right there's you know you see this done in in the Bay Area quite often, and so it's exciting to to get that here. Yeah, I agree. I know, uh, you know, as we mentioned before, Hawaii Angels was a big part of this first yep. round of funding. And uh, I'm at least looking forward to them all getting some liquidity and oh, yeah. right here at home. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> and uh, and maybe you too, Scott, you oh, very much join the Angels and invest back home too. And that's something we talk about kind of in this long term cycle, right? Yeah. So I mean, these these companies, it does take a long time to grow to this size, to mature to this level. Um, but, you know, things do cycle back around. So, you know, I know that it, it's always a tough, a tough, you know, decision to have to move like uh, Scott did to, to San Francisco. There's advantages and disadvantages to that. We could argue that all day long. But, you know, the long term issue is we want these companies to succeed. That's more important than anything yeah. else. And if they succeed, you know, capital gets cycled back around. So, um, and talent, you know, we've got yes. uh, talent that has gone through Volta. I know like Michael Menendez is now working in Hank's company, the the, the um, Blue Planet Energy company, the battery company. So, you know, there's talent that cycles back around as well. And uh, that can help the whole ecosystem kind of move forward and, and excel. So I think that's exciting for that reason too. Um, I'll remind the audience that there is a questions, uh, you know, function here. So if you have a question, you can throw it in there. Um, and I'm going to ask Scott about the future now of Volta. So paint us a picture. I know we've been joking from the beginning that, um, you know, once you open the Paris office, I'm going to run it. So we know that's happening. That's in the future. Um, and in the not too distant future, as you were telling me, I need to start practicing my French. So um, I think, you know, that's exciting. I don't know any French. Maybe we should talk about me being in a different country. I could do Spain might be better. I could learn Spanish probably a little bit easier. Uh, well, What's the future hold for you guys now? Well, we'll, we'll, we'll do some language tryouts. I'll, I'll put you against some of the team. We'll see how you do. So. Oh, no, no, I'll fail. Um, I mean, it was something that was always kind of a little bit intention uh, for us when we started the business. Like, we, we were always a little bit scared to tell investors that we thought of the business as really having kind of a 40 to 50 year plan because it wasn't a proxy for how you build a company. It was a proxy for how we thought the industry should roll out. How do you, how do you build EV charging as an industry that starts from like this era of EV charging as kind of a novelty that gets people excited about the cars to kind of first early adopters that really start to get excited and use the stations to that critical kind of early ecosystem to this becoming critical fueling infrastructure to really the fun part when EV charging functionally becomes kind of the zipper between the energy system for the grid and the energy system for transportation. That's when things get fascinating. Yeah. But the Hawaii Angel that we have a 40 year business plan was not, not really a great story. You know, the investment horizon might be a little long for people. Yeah. That has always been the story. And really right now we're at the fun part because the world is starting to realize electric vehicles make economic sense. Yeah. That at scale of manufacturing, at scale of production, these can be cheaper than gas cars. That there aren't really the trade-offs of, oh, they're, they're more expensive. It's all Tesla for Palo Alto rich people. Like it's getting to a point where it's becoming more fated to happen. Mm -hmm. And we're very, very well set up for that based on the expertise of sort of the last decade of learning how to do this. It's not an easy thing. Yeah. Well, I personally love my EV car. I now own two EVs and we have one gas guzzling car in the household. And I'm like, get rid of that thing. It's awful. <laughs> it's so, it, it starts to hurt you to have that, you know. Um, but I love this idea of two of the of it becoming the grid, right? So basically the car becomes the battery that powers your house that's back up to your full life and it all kind of works together. I think that's awesome. Um, okay, I've got a bunch of questions in here, so I'm gonna try to answer some of them. Um, one that jumped out at me, which I thought was funny is, um, which cafe in near UH Manila? <laughs> <laughs> ah, so the formative uh, first proper HQ of, of Volta is Morning Glass ca uh, Coffee Shop. Right. I knew the answer, but I wanted oh, you to yeah. get it. And yeah. like, yeah, very important. Give Morning Glass love. I love them to death. 
I, I still miss the the egg sandwiches very, very. And still very the best coffee in Honolulu. I'm here to tell you, it is definitely still the best coffee in Honolulu. All right, so we got that. I think the, the key question is: Is there a Volta station nearby that you can plug into while you go to the cafe? It is. It is a key question. I don't know that we're close enough. So I think we are so. back up on on sort of build and development in Hawaii. I was on one of my Hawaii conversations this morning, and my poor team gets more uh, harassment about how the Hawaii network is performing for the size of it versus the business than pretty much any other network. It is the yeah. better for whether this thing works or not. Yeah, yeah. Well, Daniel's always telling us that. So that's your, your Hawaii guy. He's, he's telling us about how great he's doing right here. So that's good to know. Um, all right, another question is, how do you see your role changing once you become a public company? Will it be harder for you to stay true to your mission? Mm. So Luckily, what I have found is that the mission of the business was to prove the point of building a mission-driven business in an economic system, which is kind of a weird thing to say, but I kind of wanted to prove that you could cram a 40-year mission-driven project into kind of a quarter-by-quarter -quarter investor mentality. Mm. And that's worked reasonably well. Like the story resonates pretty well with the investor market. It is definitely a balance. We are more public, we are more visible, we are in more sort of uh, public maintenance mode of the story of the stock, et cetera. But we used to go into kind of an operating hole for six months trying to fundraise for the business. And you would have kind of growth and then plateau of uh, certainly anything that I would contribute because the investment process was a large part of the time. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think that it, it certainly changes the role. It could make it more fun. It definitely makes it grow up a little bit. Yes. So I think we have another question kind of related to um, growing up a little bit. So um, this is another question for you, Scott. I'm curious, any tips for navigating investment as a young founder without a track record and previous exits? Um, I would say to, to Shinoa's earlier point, grab as much talent as you can. Um, like for me, in the earliest days, like finding Shinoa was finding people, was talking to everyone from, yeah, you know, like my dad's friends and saying, who do you know? Who do you know? And sort of a spider web out until you could get that talent. Mm -hmm. um, you quickly understand how to uh, sort of separate good advice from bad, but you will get much better advice from people who have that level of experience. And at some point, people want to give it to you even if you can only bribe them with, you know, Starbucks coffees once a month, like Shinoa in the early morning glass coffee, morning glass coffee. Oh, is this is pre morning glass. Very Shinoa very really did pre our first HQ when we actually had to go to Starbucks. Instead we of did. I totally remember that meeting. In fact, because the, the other story I like to tell to embarrass Scott is that while he looks pretty much full grown now, he looks like he was 13. When I was <laughs> and I was like, Oh, wow, this guy's really young. And he's like, Well, you got to meet, you know, my co founders. And then I go to coffee and his co founders were also like, <laughs> they weren't that young, but they just happened to look really young, all of them. And I was like, that's not helping. <laughs> well, <laughs> guys I, are not helping you. <laughs> I, I have to give a quick story. Uh, before we started the business as it was, we actually applied for a grant from uh, the Hawaii State Government four right. chargers. We, we knew that we were small. Uh, we got uh, letters of intent from 50 major businesses in Hawaii that supported us. We threw the packet to into this grant process. It scores on a hundred point scale. We got an 89 out of a hundred, which was one of the highest scores in the process. We got an in-person interview. Our score dropped from 89 to 69 because they figured out it was two 24 year old kids. <laughs> this is why we put pictures of, you know, random superheroes in our deck. <laughs> Well, what, what I would say though, right, is, I mean, and you, I think everyone hears it from you now, right? The, the conviction and confidence that you have in what you're, you're trying to do. And, you know, I think, you know, I, I still resonates today. It resonated back then. And, and that goes a long way uh, when you're sitting down with, you know, partners, potential partners or investors or folks that you're looking to support with. Um, yeah, absolutely. There's, there's a, a founder quality that investors uh, come to recognize pretty quickly. And Scott has always had that quality. Yeah. So congratulations again, Scott, on all this success and big news. And we're really happy for you. I'm gonna bring it to a close there. So yes, claps oh. everybody. Um, and that is the conclusion of day two 
of East meets West. So come back tomorrow. We're going to have our uh, return to tourism responsibly panel in, in uh, the first part of it. And then we'll have our best of pitch, three pitches that have been nominated by the VCs for this whole event to pitch to the big stage and of course more round tables. So please join us back here tomorrow. The lounge will be open until the last person's out of there. So we just keep it open forever. And uh, thanks again, Greg and Scott. Aloha. No, thank you. Thank you everybody. Much Aloha. appreciated.